right, so let's review a little bit because it's been a week and it's difficult material. So let's review a little bit, Marcel, what we did so far and then get into the um, last two uh, feelings that we're going to talk about. So remember, right, Marcel is responding to Nietzsche. We are responding to Nietzsche, right? The main issue with Nietzsche, this is, by the way, your test question, so it's good to listen. The main issue with Nietzsche is that we are so miserable we feel so miserable, and so we overcompensate by creating in our minds this whole narrative that everything's going to be okay, that there's a God, that there's a creator, that you know, there's life after death, and we're all going to be okay. Right? And, and we create this out of a feeling of misery. Right? We feel wretched, we feel lost in the world, we feel completely uh, abandoned, and so to compensate, to, to survive this trauma, this suffering, we elaborate in our minds this huge, massive, collective delusion, as Nietzsche calls it, right? So, very good, excellent criticism. This is, I wouldn't put it past us to do that. This is very typical, right? Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> right? So, uh, so we, we and, and this is, by the way, something we do, right? That's why I'm, I was very moved by Nietzsche's argument, because even individually we do this, right? Remember I give you the example? You have a crush on someone, they text you out of the blue. You have a whole narrative that builds up in your mind about how that person probably loves you and it's gonna be, you have 10 years plan. What? We do that, right? So it's, it's, it's totally reasonable to think with Nietzsche that we would do this collectively. Like it's, it's something we do, right? So it's very hard to circumvent this, 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 uh, this criticism that Nietzsche is addressing the religious mindset. It's, it's very difficult. But I think Marcel is on to something. So he might help us today. He's already helping us. So one of the ways Marcel is helping is by saying, well, so he's also going to argue for this other dimension, right? except he's not going to argue for it. He's not going to say it's an a intellectual construction. He's going to say it's an actual dimension, which we know exists through the feelings we have about it, right? And, and for him, remember, feelings are very serious. We can take our feelings seriously because feelings from ourselves always point to a reality. There is always a reality at the origin of your feeling. If you're sad, something happened. If you're angry, something happened. We don't have, you know, random feelings. There's always a cause somewhere down the line. So for Marcel, feelings are intentional. They point to a reality. So if you're feeling something, you're sensing a reality behind it, right? So Marcel is saying, uh, remember, he's exploring these feelings and he realizes there are some feelings which you can't find a cause in the real world. And so therefore the cause might be deeper. There might be a deeper reality, which is provoking these feelings, right? And so uh, in as much as we, so he's gonna talk about three feelings, right? We, we talked about the feeling of, uh, for love, right? Today we talk about hope and then also presence, but these are three feelings which when we are feeling it, we are actually tapping into this deeper dimension. We couldn't feel these feelings unless there was this deeper dimension, which is, uh, provoking these feelings, right? So you can already see the difference with Nietzsche, right? Um, uh, can anyone tell me the main difference between what Marcel is talking about and what Nietzsche is talking about? There is a very clear distinction, which is really the key here. Anybody see the, the difference? Uh, so before, so I'll ask again, let me give you the example we had with fate, right? One of these feelings, and then I'll, I'll get you, right? Uh, well, he's just saying that we're delusional for making up this whole world in our minds. And then, like Marcel saying, since we have these feelings, we always point to something within. Like we're angry, we're always angry at something. So if we have feelings for something, there must be something within. That we're like. Exactly right. The feeling you cannot construct. I have the feeling it's something is going on, right? Uh, the mind, you, the delusion, yes, you can construct, right? So that's the main difference. The feeling, I'm, I'm hit by it. I'm not creating it. I'm, it comes out of the blue, it's boom, I'm having this experience, I'm tapping into this dimension. I'm not creating this, I'm not in control. Whereas the delusion, I'm in full control, I'm creating this big narrative so I can feel better, right? So one of the examples we had last time was the feeling that it was meant to be. Remember, you meet someone, a very uh, valuable person, whether it's romantically or a friend or a mentor, and you have the sense that somehow it was orchestrated, right? And I asked and a bunch of you felt this feeling that ah, it was meant to be, it was orchestrated. Something brought us together. When you're talking like that, what are you tapping into? What are you saying? That there is a something working on your behalf in the backstage and putting things together, that's being. At that moment, you are tapping into being. Do you follow? So we kind of say kind of randomly, right? We're like, ah, oh, something brought us together. We kind of say it like, 
without thinking. But when you're, anytime you're saying, anytime you're thinking, this was orchestrated, something brought us together, what are you saying then that there is something that seems to be working on your behalf? And that thing that is working on your behalf is exactly the definition of being for Marcel. So at that moment, you are sensing that there is being. <laughs> You're sensing that dimension. You're sensing that there is something in this world, a force which is working on your behalf. Are you following me for that one? So, and this you did not create. You, ha you had the encounter and you feel that it was meant to be. You didn't create that feeling. It hits you like, damn, this is meant to be. And you're just in the feeling, right? So you're not creating this. It's therefore not a delusion, like Marcel is saying, okay? Are we good so far, everybody with me? That's the review. <laughs> okay, today we go into two more feelings like this, hope and presence. Okay, so let me break down hope a little bit. First of all, uh, actually, let me first tell the story how Marcel stumbled upon this concept, right? So remember, I told you in the introduction, right? Marcel uh, used to work for the Red Cross. So he was the one uh, during the war, right, World War I. So he was the one who was tasked to bring the news to the families that their son had died. That was just the most horrible job. He had to go and bring the whatever was left. Sometimes nothing was left. They just figured they got, they died, right? And he would have to bring this news to the family. So as he started to do that, he noticed a constant. He noticed something strange. Every single family he would go to would somehow still hope that the son was alive somewhere. Somehow they hadn't died. Yes, this is the uniform, but maybe they escaped. Yes, this is, uh, you don't have many, you don't have anything to bring us. Well, that's even more reason to believe that maybe he's somewhere out there. So, and systematically he encountered this reaction until the point where he was thinking, they can't all be crazy, <laughs> right? These are respectable families, respectable people. These are people who are rational. Why are they all reacting in this? Most of them, right? We're reacting in this way, like somehow he must still be out there. There is hope and so forth. And so he began to reflect on this. What is going on? How are these people feeling this in the, in the sight of the evidence? Right? The evidence is pointing to that the, the soldier is dead, and yet the family has this sense that it's going to be okay, that they're okay, right? And so Marcel, really, that really moved him. And remember, he was an agnostic at the time. He wasn't religious. Those families were not religious. Nobody was religious, right? Um, and yet they're having these profound feelings, right? These profound metaphysical feelings. And so he's pondering it. And at that moment, he is, and now he's going to talk about it, right? In this particular essay, this is where he's really reflecting on this experience. And so what he's noticing is that hope is first of all to be distinguished from optimism. That's the first thing we have to clarify right now. Hope is different from optimism. Can anyone tell me what is optimism? Somebody who's an optimist, what are they basing their optimism on? Okay. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Nobel. Yes, but what are they, why are they so, what, what's their basis? What, what makes them so optimistic? Uh, based on like, something bad, so like, say like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, so you're, you're, you're almost between optimism and hope. <laughs> uh -huh. That's hope. <laughs> Optimism is different. Yes. Yes, and based on what? What makes you an optimist? What kind of people are optimists? Yes. Yes, and why are they so happy? What made them so happy? What's the basis for their happiness? <laughs> yes, but why are they so positive? What makes them, what's the basis of their positivity? <laughs> yes, why? <laughs> Okay, that sounds like hope. You guys are very, you're, you're deep into hope. Optimism is very simple. An optimist one, the definition of Marcel, right? An optimist is someone who has reason to feel that it's going to be okay. The optimist has reasons. Actually, I'll explain. So in other words, for example, the optimist knows that he pulled through before and therefore he's going to pull through again. Or the optimist knows that, you know, my family made it, eventually they made it, so I'm going to make it eventually. Or they saw their friends, you know, they you know, worked, uh, worked through this difficult relationship and therefore I can. So the optimist usually, uh, in the definition of Marcel, right? Optimist is someone who has reason to be optimistic. There is actual evidence in reality that yes, we can pull through. 
yes, we can make it. Yes, he's made it in the past. Therefore, he'll make it in the future. Are you following? This is different from hope. We'll see, right? So the optimist is someone who is basing his um, joy, <laughs> right, on past experience that went well. So for example, you've always passed exams, you know, you, you, you've always pulled through. So now there's a big exam coming up. Well, you're optimistic. You're going to be okay because you've pulled through before. Are you good? So optimism is based in realities, based in evidence. There's in this, in the here and the now, or in, in your past, right? In, you can see there's facts. There's factual evidence that you can pull through. Or you're struggling in your, in, in, with a friendship and, well, you know that... Um, You've had struggles before and now you can pull through or you've seen your siblings struggle in the same way and they made it. So now you can make it or your family, right? Or maybe you're poor, but your family made it. So now you feel I'm optimistic. One day I'll make it, right? Okay, that's optimism. Hope is very different. It's the opposite. Hope is the same feeling that it's going to be okay, but it's not based in reality. There is zero evidence, <laughs> right? It's never worked. <laughs> and now you think it's going to work? That's hope. Okay, you see what I'm saying? You always failed at this. And now all of a sudden it's going to work out. That's hope. So, so that's the first distinction, right? Between hope and optimism. Hope has no evidence. This is the case of those families, right? They receive the uniform of the soldier who is dead, supposedly. And they have all the evidence that he's dead. The person is telling them he's dead. They're counted as dead. They have all the uniform and, the, and they still hope against the evidence. Optimism is hoping with a backup of evidence. Hope is hoping against the evidence. Are you seeing the distinction? Right, so for example, you've always, let, let's give you, this is a really great example. Um, suppose everyone in your family poor, they're gambling, they're, you know, they're messing up, they're, right, they're not working, there's a whole, your family's messed up. No money. And yet you have a feeling you're gonna make it. <laughs> no evidence, right? Zero evidence from your family, from your background, from you, right? And yet you have this feeling, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be okay. That's hope. Now, your family, your, let's imagine now a different scenario. You're broke. You're not doing well, but your family's wealthy. They made it. You're like, I'm going to make it. What's that? Hope or optimism? Optimism, right? Because you have the basis. <laughs> that's the difference, okay? So, that's, that's, so, 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 so Marcel is saying there's no basis in reality. Where there is the basis? Where is this basis? Remember, Marcel is, is really thinking out loud, right? In the whole book, we have to go through this with him, right? The way that he's going, thinking in our presence. So he's thinking, what can then be the basis of hope if there is no evidence for it? And again, he's saying, well, perhaps, same argument, right? Perhaps there is a deeper reality that I'm tapping into. Perhaps I'm tapping into this profound mystery that in the end all will be well. That there is, again, same thing, something on my side that will bring me through. That there is something that will move me forward, even though there is no evidence. So it's always the same intuition that there's something working on our behalf, right? Anytime you're thinking something is working on my behalf, or you know how we say it nowadays, we say the universe will, you know, the universe... You know, how do you talk? How do you talk? Uh, how do you people talk when you talk about the universe? What is some of the expressions? On our side. The universe on our side. Universe has my back. The universe, right? Uh, gave me a parking place. Right? Yeah. I mean, we talk like that. When you're talking like that, you're being Marcellians, right? You're, you're tapping into that dimension without knowing it even, right? So, yeah. so he's saying that's so what hope people is. people use these things manifesting. Exactly. You're manifesting. Um, I'm, I'm a little worried about the manifest. Actually, let's talk about yes, that. The difference sorry. between hope and manifesting. This is a really good question. So all of you are in into the, in, 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 um, in onto the secret, right? You, you found, have you heard about this, the secret? Some people have not. Not you? Oh, not all of you? Okay. This is a big deal. This is a new agey thing where you can basically manifest everything you put your mind to if you're positive. If you think and you visualize it with great positivity, it's going to come to you. I love it personally. I hope <laughs> I mean, but here's the problem, right? Hope is not the same thing as manifesting, right? Manifesting, you're in control. I want a Lamborghini. I had a friend like that. I wanted his Lamborghini. He had a big a vision board with a Lamborghini. And every day he would look at his Lamborghini and be like, I'm going to get this Lamborghini. You know what a Lamborghini is, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Guess that someone thinks it's a sausage or something. <laughs> it's a car. It's a very fancy car, right? So he was visualizing his Lamborghini and he was like, affirming it. He was saying little affirmations. You know, I'm going to get this. This is different from hope because hope, you're not in control of the outcome. You just sense everything's going to be all right, but you don't know how. <laughs> so, and you're not in control. 
hope is really dwelling in a state of grace. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I just feel it's going to be hap- It's going to be okay. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know how it will take place, but I sense everything will be okay. Manifesting is, I want a Lamborghini. <laughs> I want this precise thing, and I'm going to make it happen, right? That's very different. Hope is, that's not a state of grace. That's a state of striving. That's he magic, did. right? Magic versus he hope. Um, no, he never got the car. <laughs> I don't think he got the Some car yet. people do that. No, it does work. I mean, anytime you're, of course, positive thinking is very powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. But this is not the same, right? So we have three distinctions. Optimism, based on the past. Positive thinking, which is a kind of effort, right? I'm going oh, to make this happen. And hope, which is really state of grace. I don't know. I just feel it's going to be okay. So your tap, it's not you. See, optimism and, and manifesting, you're in control. You're the only one there, right? Hope is different. You're tapping into something deeper. You're sensing that something is going to work it out somehow. You don't know when, you don't know how, but you sense that there is something on your side that's going to work it out in time. And so you're kind of, you don't know where this feeling is coming from. You did not, you cannot generate this feeling. It's just there. That's hope. Everybody clear on that? Does that make sense? Okay. So good question on the manifesting. That's a really good, um, yeah, very good. So, um, Let's, let's go to that quote again, which is, again, this, I think we quoted it last time, but let's, it, it doesn't hurt to go back. Right, this is, hope consists, second line on 28. Are you there? Who is there? Oh, two, two people wave at me who are there. Okay. Hope consists in asserting, right, so you're really sensing strongly, right, that there is at the heart of being, beyond all data, so this is beyond all evidence, beyond all facts, beyond all what's in front of you, right? Beyond all inventories, all calculations, there is a mysterious principle which is in connivence with me. Connivence, if you know Spanish, you understand. Con, in Spanish, what does it mean? With. with, okay? There's a principle which is with me, on my side, working for me and working with me. Uh, and this, and he goes even further, which cannot but will that which I will, if what I will deserves to be willed, and is in fact willed by the whole of my being. This is very powerful. So, but this is not magic. Magic, you decide what's going to happen. And then you <laughs> focus your energy, right? Mm-hmm. Hope is you don't know. You're just, you feel it's going to be okay. You did not ask. You did, you just, the feeling comes to you. Like, uh, I don't know, a dove <laughs> just resting on you, right? The feeling is there, kind of comforting and making you realize that, well, somehow it will be okay. I don't know how. It's not in my control. So versus the manifesting and hope, there's a difference, which is the difference between control and surrender, right? Hope is really a surrender. I'm like, I don't know how it's going to happen, but um, that's my hope that I sense that it's going to be okay, okay? Okay, so are you? So how many of you have had this experience of hope? I'm just curious. How many of you can oh, yeah. r- relate to this feeling, right? A few of you. So uh, always about a fourth of the class, and the rest of you still have to live in the experience, right? So uh, a, a few of you have had this. So you know, and again, right with Marcel, the the crazy thing that the I mean, it's difficult. The challenging thing with Marcel is that you cannot know that what he's saying is true until you have experienced it. This is what existentialism is about, right? Existentialism is not going to prove you on the board with an equation. Yeah, hope, being, being exists. Here's a microscope. There's being, right? No. The only way you can really prove that what he's saying is true is to really experience it, go through it, be open to the experience. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then you know, those of you who have hope, you, see, you, you hear him and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. I, I get it, right? So again, Marcel is not saying, he's never saying, it's a fact that being exists and that there is somebody on our side. He's not preaching to us, right? He's not, he's not, a, he's not a Christian. He's not a pastor. He's not a priest. He's not, you know, pontificating about this, you know. He's saying, it seems to me there is no other explanation for this feeling than that there might be such a dimension. It's always might be with Marcel, right? He cannot prove it to us, but he's saying, I can't find another explanation for this feeling than the fact that there might be a deeper dimension which I am tapping into. Do you follow? So it's not, he will never, you know, force this down your throat, right? He's never going to say, ah, being, you have to believe in being. No, he's going to say, this is for me the only explanation of this feeling. It seems to me that there must be a deeper dimension. I cannot be for sure, right? But I'm inviting you to explore this. Marcel is always an invitation. 
It's never a threat, right? It's always an invitation. Here's what I am sensing. Here's what I feel might be right there going on. And this is an invitation for us to experience it, to explore it, to be open to it, and thereby to, to have that experience, right? Okay, any questions about hope so far? Um, anything you want to say? Yes. It's not, it's not a question, but I feel like this is also, it reminds me of like, when you just get rid of that feeling, like sometimes you have this feeling of like, oh, I probably shouldn't go there, but like, I don't know why, like, I just like to feel it. This is interesting what you're saying because um, he doesn't talk about this, right? But it's a similar thing. You don't know where it's coming from. You do it and it ends up being the right thing to do. What did you tap into, right? Some wisdom. Where is this wisdom? Not here. Nobody, nobody gonna, right? Rationally makes no sense, right? With regards to the evidence makes no sense. So again, Marcel would say, yeah, this is another way you're tapping into something deeper than just your common sense or your rationality. There is more to life than rationality and evidence. That's what he said, right? Good, that's a good point. Uh, yes. So, okay, so what, what would you describe the feeling? So, you know how you, uh, the feeling of like the families and how they felt that like uh, their son could be heard because of the evidence and the realities of this other life is called the feeling of hope? Yeah. What would, you call, what would you call the feeling of, uh, of like that something was meant to be? Like, That's a. Uh, uh, Marcel, I, I would call it the feeling of fate, right? It's, it was meant to be. I just titled it love, right? It's not the feeling of love, clearly. I would call it the, thank you, that's a good question. Feeling of fate, that it was fated, that somehow it happened. I would call it that. Marcel doesn't give it a name, <laughs> right? He just talks about love and encounters, but that's how I would call it. So you can write it like that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, can't. It means, it, so, you don't know how it's going to turn out, but you sense it's going to be okay, right? You have to live a full life to know the outcome, right? And so remember, Marcel, he is even, um, I think this is even something that goes beyond death. I think even if you saw that corpse, you could still hope that some, you, you could still be hit by that feeling. And that's where it becomes interesting. Why am I being hit with a feeling in the real evidence? I see the coffin and I'm sensing it's gonna be okay, right? Uh, so, so Marcel seems to be saying, Death is not a final door, and we'll talk about that in a second, right? If we're feeling that it's going to be okay in spite of the coffin, then there is something deeper that we don't know, <laughs> but we're getting a hint of it. What it is, we don't know, but it's just a sense that it's in spite of this, it's going to be okay. It's insane, right? Rationally makes no sense, <laughs> right? So this uh, idea, when it gets really clear, we'll talk about with a, a feeling of presence is more clear. Hope is when you're not sure yet, right? So even, right, as life goes on, even when things go badly, you continue to have this feeling means there must be something working. And eventually, it's only at the end of your life that you can see the whole scenario, right? We do not see the plot right now. We see one line, two lines. <laughs> we don't have the full movie. Imagine you turn on, I don't know, what movie? I'm um, trying to think of a movie that was very dramatic. Anybody have an idea? Dramatic. Yes. Give me a latest movie that's super... Dune. What? Dune. 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 Yeah, right. Yes. So you have, right, if you, if you do, I haven't seen it, so I can't, um, okay. but suppose you, you turn on the TV at a moment where everything's going badly, right? <laughs> This is how we are. We see, we turn on the TV of our lives right now. It's like a little snapshot. We don't have the whole movie, right? So what Marcel is saying, you have to wait to have the whole movie. And then looking back, you will see, I think Kierkegaard says that too, whom we didn't study, that we can only understand our lives looking back, not looking forward. As you look back, you will begin to see how things fit together, why this had to happen. What it, and so you're starting to see the wisdom of it, right? But again, right, this is very mysterious. Even Marcel is not sure what's happening. I am not sure what's happening, right? I don't know, right? But I, I'm not in control of the universe. I'm like you, right? But he's just saying, let's pay attention to this. There is something going on. Let's be open to it. That's all he can say. That's all I can say, right? So I wish I could do, you know, the, <laughs> the Disney version. <laughs> like, do, 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 happy ending and the live, right? But no, even in spite of, even if our lives is not a Disney movie, the fact that we have this feeling is telling us, it's a message, it's telling us something. And Mar what Marcel is saying, all he's saying is let's pay attention to this. Let's not just, right? 
there's something going on deeply that we are cannot be sure of, but it's something going on and we need to pay attention to it. That's all he can say, right? At this point of our lives. We are all in the tiny moment of the movie, right? Yes, Imran. Um, so that's an Okay, very good question, right? How do we know hope is not a form of denial, right? It, hope is a, is a feeling of fullness. Denial is coming from a feeling of emptiness and then your brain kicks in. You see what I mean? So you, you have the denial is a bad feeling at the origin of it. You see what I mean? So you're, you're trying to hide or crush the feeling of, by saying, no, it can't be, it can't be. And you can sense the effort. There's an effort in denial. Do you see what I mean? Anybody who's denying something, you can sense that it's perspiration. <laughs> so hope, on the other hand, is just like you're, you're just calm. You're very relaxed if you're in hope, right? You're not trying to force this, you know, your view. You're very relaxed. And so in that sense, you can sense the emotional quality is different, right? Hope, the emotional quality is just, I don't understand it, but somehow I sense it's going to be okay and I receive it. Denial is very, there is an element of anxiety behind it and you're trying to crush it. Do you see the difference? Yeah, that, that would be the way I could answer that. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, any other questions on hope before we go to the most, uh, this is the most uh, courageous thing a philosopher has done, which is to try to make an argument for life after death. Nobody has tried that, <laughs> right? Plato just assumed it, right? Plato wrote a whole book on that uh, when he wrote about the death of Socrates. Um, but Marcel here is really trying to tell us there is something we need to pay attention to. There is some uh, way, we, uh, there's an opening here and he's, he's going to... Uh, explore this opening through the third feeling which is the feeling of presence so let's talk about that a little bit so this is more rare personally i haven't had this experience right i've heard about it but i haven't had it some of you probably had this experience this is a feeling that and, and by the way again going back to marcel he is again coming from his own experience remember i told you his mother died when he was like four and yet he remembers throughout his life feeling his mother's presence with him. It's very unusual. Well, maybe not so unusual. Some of you might have sensed that, right? His mother died. He has no recollection of her. So it's not about remembering and then feeling good, right? Some of us, we look at old pictures like, oh, you know, I feel good. No, he's not remembering anything. There's nothing in his mind. And yet he's feeling her actual physical presence wherever he was as he was growing up, right? So this is an experience which he's saying, huh, I wonder what this means. Where is this coming from? What does, and so now as a mature man, right, he's writing about this, right? So this is basically the feeling, and I, I think some of you might have had this experience. Somebody dies, and usually it has to be someone very close to you. There has to be a powerful bond of love. If it's just some random cousin, you know, that you never met, <laughs> it's not gonna happen, right? Somebody you had a deep connection with, they die, and you go through the mourning process and so forth. And at one point, you begin to feel their, their presence. Not, not like a, it's not a ghost, right? It's not a ghost going around, boom, you know, going in your house, you know, shaking things up, you know, moving objects. This is not it, right? This is not something that's happening visibly. The problem with ghosts is that they're too in this reality, right? Presence is just a feeling. You're just sensing that person is with you, right? I'll tell you two stories about that. Um, so I don't have the experience, but I have two stories. Uh, this is a beautiful story. I, I went to visit someone's grandmother who was very sick. She was, um, you know, kind of not doing too good. And in the hospital, they put her in those, you know, little rooms with little blue curtains, you know. And that's it. She was in this, she was basically, the room was as big as a stable. And then there were blue curtains all around. And that, that was her life. And so I came and I was like, hey, you know, you're not bored here, you know. And, um, you know, she was single. Her husband had passed a few years back. And, and she looks at me and she's like, no. He is always with me, right? Uh, alluding to her husband, right? Who had passed. She was like, I'm never alone. He's always with me. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's okay. So I just shut up. You know? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what to say. So, <laughs> so that was one, one experience that someone had. The other one that I read about, which I found was really powerful, was this was a French movie star um, who was writing about the death of her companion. This was a man she had lived with for 20, 30 years. So they were practically married, but um, you know, not officially. He dies 
And she talks about her experience. And she says, for two weeks, I was in total darkness. I couldn't feel, I couldn't eat, I couldn't think, and nothing. It was, I was swallowed up by darkness. And after those two weeks, something happened, something shifted, where all of a sudden I felt this peace and this presence of my beloved was still with me. This is very strange experiences, right? This is, not everyone has these. Anybody has, I'm just curious, how many of you in the class have had something like that? Feeling that's so one person, two, okay, so you, they're very, small minority understand this, right? So Marcel again is saying, well, continuing on the same line of thought, if I'm feeling something and there's nothing in reality <laughs> that is, creating this feeling, my, my parent is not there, my loved one is not there, there's nothing, their body is not there, then perhaps again I'm tapping into this deeper realm and perhaps that is where they are, not existing in the same way as now, but somehow they still are. They must be if I'm feeling something. Remember for myself, feelings always point to a reality. They are real, maybe not in the way, not in flesh and blood, but it seems based on this feeling that there is still a reality somehow going on, yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, a lot of you have this. That's true. Um, yeah, I think that's. Just, I think you can argue for that, that it's a dream and it's like, what could have provoked this dream, right? So mm. people will argue because people can always argue against it and be like, oh, you ate a big lunch, you miss your grandmother. You know, that's why you're having this dream, right? But some people, but you feel that the dream is real. You see what I mean? So again, you're not deluding yourself. There's no anxiety. You're like, I know this is something is profound. Something happened here in this dream. You know it. So again, how do you, that feeling, right? It, that would be more like hope, right? A sense that this is real or faith, right? Um, and again, Marcel is saying, I cannot prove to you that they exist, right? I cannot go and dig the grave and show you, you know, I haven't had, you know, near death experiences. I don't, but here's a feeling we have. Feelings usually point to reality. What if there is still a reality? What if that person is still somehow real? Yet, albeit not flesh and blood, but may, they're still somehow real and we are still connected in that way through the presence, right? It's a very, very daring, courageous step that he's taking because this is completely beyond reason, right? Yet he's making an argument for it, right? Okay, any questions on that? It does yeah. seem reminiscent, and it is kind of horrific other side to it that some people have sleep paralysis, you further sleep paralysis, right? Vigli, so that's when people uh, they wake up and they can't move at all. Oh. They have these like uh, hallucinations. Why, why not be hallucinations? They could be feelings of like evil presences. They see like horrific creatures, like shadow people, like frighten them. Like I have a friend who like sees like shadows, shadow people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the uh, you know at the uh, foot of her bed. I, I've heard one story of this one girl woke up and she saw this like demonic entity screaming at her and yeah, you know, and she couldn't move. Like so this is different, right? Because yeah. this is happening here and now. Mm -hmm. And you're visualizing. Yeah. Could be your Visual, mind, yeah. right? Could like, be. I think I've had one. Exactly. Some exactly. Yeah. So this is different. This is, there is nothing in reality, right? This is just a feeling. Yeah. And yet Marcel is saying this feeling is a messenger. That's all he's saying. Let us take our feelings like messengers. Let's not just brush them away like, ah, this can't be, blah, you know, and we push it away. No, maybe there's a message that you're missing because your reason always crashing down everything, crushing down everything, right? So what he's saying, basically he's saying, right? All he's saying is these, we have these feelings that are very unique, that are very profound, that are not connected to reality. What if these feelings were pointing us to a deeper reality that actually is? What if, right? That's all he's saying. What if, we could, what if we took these feelings seriously? Where would they lead us? That's the question I want to leave you with, right? Let me say it again. What if we took these feelings seriously? Where would they lead us, right? What dimension would they open up for us if we allowed them to do so, right? Um, and that's, that's the idea here, right? So um, in conclusion, right? Um, one of you asked, I forget if it was in this class or in another class I taught, right? How do we, so if being exists, right? All he has been doing is proving that there might be this dimension that's on our side, etc., right? And remember, for him, that's the solution to despair. Remember, that was the problem, right? Despair for him is because we have disconnected from this dimension. This is why we talked about jokingly last time, we are also addicted to something, right? Whether it's, a, right, uh, whether it's TikTok or Netflix or 
you know, deeper, darker addictions, right? But we are a society of addicts, and me included, by the way. I'm putting myself totally in there. I'm addicted to Netflix, you know, full, full disclosure. Uh, <laughs> so, and to food, <laughs> right? So we all have this. Why? Because we are, you know, we are a society that is disconnected with this deeper dimension. And so what Marcel has been doing is saying, and yet we have these messages. These are feelings that are saying there is something deeper working on our behalf. And so the question is, right, how do we reconnect to this dimension? Now that we have maybe an inkling that there is something there, how do we proactively create the connection? And Marcel says this beautifully here on page 38. So let's go there. Um, go on page 37, the last sentence. With eight, just eight. A presence. <laughs> okay, are you there? Wave at me if you're there. Yes. So 37 to 38. So it starts with A on 37 and then presence is on 38. Okay, so he says it's a presence and this is talking about presence, right? The feeling of presence. A presence is a reality, right? You are tapping into a reality. Maybe it's not a reality on this level, but you see if, if feelings are real, if feelings are pointing to reality, then what is to say that there's not a reality which is awakening or at the origin of this feeling, right? It is a kind of influx, and then here's the key. How do we connect? How do we um, strengthen our connection to being? It depends upon us to be permeable to this influx, but not to tell the truth, to call it forth. Let me talk about that. So just taking the example of somebody who died, right? He's saying it's, we need to be permeable to it. Let's be open to it. Let's not, if it happens, if we have an experience like you did, uh, Vega, you had a dream or you have a feeling or uh, so I have a friend, she heard her mother's voice, right? After she passed, it was already gone. And yet she heard her voice audibly telling her you need to be strong or something like that, right? So he's saying, let us be open to it. Let's not dismiss it immediately with our reason, which is just a narrow part of our whole humanity let's be open to it but at the same time he's saying let us not call it forth so this is not the time to go see a psychic and be like hey i want to hear my mother's voice can you make it happen right you can't make being happen right you can't go and tell being do this do that right so a lot of us however right we still want to be in the control and so we go and we want to make these experiences happen so we go wherever we can to get a message, to make it happen, to, you know. And, and so Marcel is saying, we need to be very careful. With these experiences, you cannot force these things. You cannot force the realm of being. Realm of being comes to you. It's a state of grace. It's not something you should make happen. Don't go after looking, you know, to some medium trying to get in contact <laughs> with the dead, right? Marcel was actually against that, right? He said, you shouldn't do that because at that point, you're not in the state of grace anymore. You're striving. You're back on this plane right? Your, your, your experience is not going to happen on this plane. It's over. <laughs> but by trying to make it happen on this plane, you're losing the profound experience you could be having on the deeper level. Are you following me? Don't go to mediums. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> do what you want. <laughs> you can do what you want. But Marcel was actually cautious about that. He said he was cautious because he believed that the dimension of being is not something we can force. It's not something we can make happen. It's only something we can receive. And when you try to force on this level to make it happen now in this life, you're missing the profound experience you could be having on the deeper dimension, right? That's all he's saying. Um, so that's the idea. The, the idea, what Marcel is saying, again, this whole book was just an invitation. Here is the possible explanation for these feelings. And when they come to you, don't brush them off. That's all he's saying. When you get this experience of hope or when you feel this experience of fate, right, that it was meant to be, or when you feel this presence, don't immediately dismiss it because it's not rational, right? Reason is a tiny way that we approach the world. There is so much more beyond reason in this life. Why are you wanting everything to fit in reason, right? So he's saying, let's not allow reason to crush the experience, but let's receive the experience. And the more we receive these experiences, the more we will get them. The more we will feel hopeful, the more we will uh, feel faith. Or like Ebrani said, the more we will receive these intuitions, right? This is what you should do. This is where you should go. So it's really, you cannot control, but you can be open. The more we are open and receptive, 
to this to these experiences uh, the more we will receive these experiences the more we will be connected uh, i think what ibrani is saying is the most helpful because i have that one i can understand i get a lot of gut feelings like that too and i ignore them <laughs> because my brain kicks in it's like why <laughs> it's like why should i bring my raincoat the sky is blue right <laughs> you know what i mean it's gonna pour by the way yeah, yeah. just so you know <laughs> it's gonna pour so you know you get it. So I systematically push them down, but I know for a fact, if I were to listen more, I would get more of these. They would get louder, right? These intuitions, what I should do. So this is the same idea, right? He said, all we can do is be permeable. This is a different level than science. Science cannot even approach this. This is a deeper level of reality. Do not use your reason to approach it, but you can use your heart. Remember Rumi, same thing, right? Rumi. This is the knowledge of the heart that uh, Marcel is really developing here philosophically, right? Okay, great. Any questions? Any questions? This is crazy, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a crazy today. philosophy. Huh? It reminds me of this one proverb I heard somewhere where uh, someone asked if this group of monks, uh, if I wanted to achieve enlightenment, you know, what should I do? And uh, should I meditate two hours a day? And then one of them said, well, if you do that, it might take 10 years. But then he said, okay, if I do it four hours a day, um, the monks replied, oh, if you do that, it would take 20 years. The idea is you try hard to take it longer. Right, right. Very good. Oh, I see yeah. that. I, I guess, sorry, I'm a little slow with the weather. You guys got it? Yeah. <laughs> Before me? <laughs> For those who didn't get it, right, let me say it again. This is a good one. This is a good example. He's asking, when can I reach enlightenment? If I meditate two hours a day, will I reach enlightenment? When will I reach enlightenment? The monk says, in 10 years. Okay, okay, so if I do four hours a day, when will it be? In 20 years, right? So meaning the more effort you put in, the, the, the more this thing is going to escape. So it's the same with being. The more you try to control it, like manifesting, right? Manifesting the kind of magic mentality or trying to go and make the deceased reappear, right? Trying to make things happen, you're going to miss it. It's really a state of grace where you have to receive it, be open to it, and then um, don't... Um, dismiss it when it comes to you right okay so hopefully now you are uh, you have the tools to respond to Nietzsche I wish you luck <laughs> so um so that test when did we say what did I say Easter Sunday. oh Easter Sunday I'm giving you a test to do on Easter Sunday right. um that's so sad you know what let's make it do on uh midnight on Sunday is that okay oh. That ruins your Sunday, though. Since I'm on vacation, I feel a little more liberal. Um, how about it's due Monday morning, uh, Monday noon, Monday noon. Okay, so have a happy Easter, no? <laughs> Monday noon. Okay, Monday noon. I'll put it on Blackboard. So that was our Easter gift. Being, being is gifting you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the second question, it actually sounds 